So giving honor to God, God is our creator, our redeemer, and our provider. And we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. And we love our neighbors as ourselves as we give honor to our spiritual guides, to our founder, Mildred Miller, to his holiness and blessed memory, Master Melvin Davis, to our Supreme Father, Marshall Davis, and to our Supreme Mother, Aletha Rubina Drake Davis. Giving honor to our officials who are servants of us all, to our national officials, to our local officials and through officials throughout the world. We give them honor. We give honor to all families as they live and struggle and learn from life lessons. We give honor to them, those who are living, those who have passed away. We honor them today and give honor to our congregation, those who are with us now and those who will join us and those who may see this later as a video. We give you honor and say, Hotep, peace abide, shalom. So for our th first, we're going to have our, our reading of our scripture. And I see everyone is muted, so I'm not going to do the mute all. And remember the way the system works now, if you want to speak, you need to unmute yourself. And the way to do that if you are on a, on a telephone is to press star and six. And if you're in a computer, if you take your cursor down to the bottom of the page, you usually have some symbols come up and one of them will allow you to unmute yourself. But now let's have the reading of the 72nd Psalm. And to do that, let me first throw my glasses. <clears throat> Here beginneth. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon through all generations. May he be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days, may the righteous flourish and prosperity abound until the moon is no more. May he rule from sea to sea and from the river to the end of the earth. May the desert tribes bow before him and his enemy, enemies lick the dust. May the king of Tarish and of distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba present, present him with gifts. May all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him, for he will deliver the needy that cry out, the afflicted, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live, may gold from Sheba be given him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. May grain abound throughout the land, on the top of the hills may it sway. May the crops flourish like Lebanon and thrive like the grass in the fields. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. Then all nations will be blessed through him and they will call him blessed. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen. And amen. This concludes the prayers of David, son of Jesse. And now we have our Lord's Prayer. Again, everyone is muted, so we won't disturb each other as we're saying it, but I would like you to repeat it in unison with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen, amen, amen. And now for our song, we're going to be singing Hawk the Herald's Angels Sing. And one of the reasons I chose this song uh, is because it had that, that uh, Herald Angels singing. And to know that we have spiritual forces that are there, uh, these angels, these Herald Angels that are singing and trying to inspire us when it talks about that uh, celestial garment, that there are these angels that are there to help to bring peace and joy to us. And of course, the first verse of Hark the Herald Angels Sing is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all the nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. As a witful angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Now for our meditation, we will be, uh, meditation is called Love Endures All Things. Again, uh, everyone is muted. And I would ask you to uh, repeat after me. Again, the muting is just a function we do to help to make sure that we don't step all the all of each other's toes as we're speaking. And like I said, this meditation is called Love Endures All Things. Please repeat after me. O oh God, Master of the universe, you are the Lord of all. You have made this world where faith, hope, and charity abides. In your light, love protects. Love trusts, love hopes, and love endures through all circumstances. We thank you, O oh God, for you will keep us in your loving arms. Lead us to victory. Amen, amen, amen. For those who can see the screen, you can see our Dinkra symbol, which is called Aya. It, it translates as the fern, and from uh, the Dinkra symbols, and it looks like a, it almost kind of like looks like a, a tree with a, like a infinity loop down at the bottom of it, or a pair of glasses, and it means it's a symbol of endurance, independence, defiance against the difficulties, hardiness, pers uh, perseverance, and resourcefulness. Now the fern, they from Africa, they see it as a very, very hardy uh, plant. That it is, you know, it, with the whole any type of circumstances is growing, that fern just keeps growing. And so they have this one called a fern that we should be like a ferns, that we should be hardy like that fern, that we should uh, be there strong and able to survive against all the things that uh, attract us. Another reason that I picked this symbol for the fern is to me, it still looks like a tree. It looks like a Christmas tree. And I want to remind myself to even talk about uh, the Christmas tree and some of the ornaments and things that we do that, that they too are there to make us remember about this endurance and this independence. Now, when we use the Christmas tree for us, we use a tree that is an evergreen tree. And that evergreen means that even through the winter, even through the hard times, even through when things are seemingly uh, rough to live through, that that evergreen tree can keep its greenness. So that's one of the lessons that we have of our Christmas tree, that like that fern or the ayah is talking us about being able to endure 
even through the hardest times, the most difficult times. And this time of year is a difficult time of year. Uh, we are during a period when there is, uh, when you're in this time of period, it's a period where there is less light for us. Uh, when I'm saying less light, the, the light time of a day or the day part of each day is shorter than the night part. It gets dark early and it stays dark for a longer period of time. And when we've been getting going through that period, actually since uh, June 21st, days have been getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Around fall, they get to uh, when the day is night is about equal around fall. And then from fall to this to December 21st, you're getting a period where you're having the longest uh, uh, periods of darkness all the way up to that period when you get to about three days of very dark days. And sometimes we don't recognize that this does have an Im impact and effect on the minds of people, that the minds of people uh, are reacting to this lack of sunlight. Remember a long time ago when I was in college and studying things, they were actually studying the effects of light, of daylight on the pituitary gland. And scientifically they showed that the pituitary gland in people uh, kind of like reacted to uh, the period of the day that had sun in it. Not even if you weren't outside, that somehow this gland uh, would react and create, create certain things uh, for you as far as giving you energy and insight during the period of light and that it did not do at night. And they saw that even other animals had this reaction that they can, they were internally, that their bodies knew and responded to uh, the amount of sunlight that they were receiving. And so during this time of Christmas, you have to know that people are going through this lack of light behind them and they need something firm and stern or like that firmness of that tree or that evergreenness of that Christmas tree or that strongness of that aria plant to know that you can just make it through this time and at Christmas time, it's going to make its turn. And the days are starting to begin to get where there's more and more light for us. And we know that this is a great time that we even celebrate the birth of Christ during this time when that light is beginning to get greater and greater and increase for us in our lives. But during that time, you have to look at people and know that they're going through some changes in their mind, that they're going through a period where they are uh, kind of depressed. You know, we have all these Christmas stories and most of the Christmas stories you see that they're about that. They're about people who are being uh, oppressed or being uh, like a Scrooge. They're being uh, humbugged. And, but there's so, all these things around them about Christmas that are trying to get them to see that, you know, don't have that attitude to life. Don't have that attitude where you're sinking to this, uh, this rut. Make sure you have things around you that uplift you. And that's why there are so many things that we have around Christmas time to help us uplift, uplift, uplift us, like the de decorations and the lights that we put on the tree and all those things. They're made to help uplift your mind and see that beauty in uh, that's in life. Uh, another thing we do with our Christmas tree, that's another part of the lesson. The lesson that we're going to go through in the Quran Gospel is the meeting of the seven sages. So that means seven masters from around the world came together uh, in this meeting in the story. And the reason I mentioned that seven is one thing that we like to do with our Christmas trees is right along the spine of the tree. One of the first things we'll do is we will place seven bulbs uh, up that spine of that tree. And that's to, to, to look, uh, to think of that completion for us, the, I mean, perfection. For us, seven is a number of perfection. And perfection means to make something whole. Uh, when something is perfect, it has everything it needs in it. It is it ha it's, it's whole. And so when we're thinking about that perfection, we want it to be on every level of our life, going all the way up to the top to be able to lift ourselves to that higher consciousness uh, that's at the top. So that's where we start kind of at the bottom and go up to the top of that tree. Uh, which is the way I love to do it, to get those seven principles, the seven principles of perfection uh, that we want in our lives uh, in that Christmas tree. 
So that's why we start off with the seven bulbs and then we'll add other decorations to it to show those lights and uh, glimmering things around it. Um, me, I always think about two things when I think about the lights and the uh, the gifts on the tree. Uh, the first thing I think about is that burning bush that Moses saw that had that flames that they were burning, but they did not consume the tree. Uh, and knowing that that was a part of how he knew that this tree was bringing him into the presence of God to have that burning bush there uh, that he saw. Uh, and when he saw that burning bush, he decided that, you know, I'm going to take off my sandals because I am a holy ground. And you need to think of that when you even see your tree. Think that God has a holy ground for you to stand upon when you think of those lights around that tree. And when I think of the of the, the bulbs and the other things you put on the tree, it makes me think of the tree of life, which I think the Christmas tree is a symbol of that, of the tree of life. And it says in the Bible that the tree of life had seven manner, I mean, I'm sorry, 12 manner of fruit uh, on it and that they uh, bear, were bare in their due season. And so it makes me remember that there are a multitude of blessings that God has to you when you put all those things around the tree. So that tree becomes a great symbol for us of that everlasting hope that we should have, that strength that we should have in our life, that we can withstand whatever circumstances are around us. And, uh, so, and there's so many, like we said, so many symbols of Christmas is to help us to keep in that, that good mind. Uh, in fact, another thing we want to bring up that this, we're still doing a lesson under the sign of Sagittarius and that we believe that you should try to get as many gifts as you can purchase during Sagittarius, get them because Sagittarius is more of that gift giver, is more of that one that gives you that uh, bounty uh, from Sagittarius. Uh, uh, and so it's better to get your gifts during them. The next uh, sign that's going to come in just before Christmas is Capricorn. Capricorn is a little more of a hard taskmaster. Uh, it is great that it comes at Christmas time, but it's a harder taskmaster. And I'm not saying if you haven't feel, got your gift that you don't do anything after Sagittarius moves out, but just know that you're going to get it. Remember, a lot of times that's why they say that with Santa Claus, who represents that Capricorn, uh, that he has, uh, you know, he's the one who's checking his list to see if you're naughty or nice. Uh, that's the one that he does both. And, you know, they, they have many stories about Santa Claus, if you were good, he would give you a good gift. And if you were bad, it was saying that he would give you um, a uh, a block of coal. Uh, now, a block of coal is still usable because you're in the winter time, so you can use that coal to burn it to get warmth from it. But it's becoming a more practical gift rather than a more inspiring gift, something that can help you. And so giving those gifts during that reign of Sagittarius uh, makes you more gracious and bountiful in the gifts that you give. Uh, letting Capricorn come in, you will probably still get gifts, but watch out for being uh, too much of a hard taskmaster with uh, with those gifts. So, um, like I said, there's so many great symbols that we have that we use, and these symbols are used uh, not so much as to worship anything as it is to awaken our consciousness to higher concepts of life. That's why we say the tr Christmas tree is not so that we worship the tree, but you begin to have an appreciation and, a, and an understanding of the higher concepts of life, of being uh, that evergreenness, of uh, seeing those things that uh, uh, light up your life and inspire you during a period that normally is a very dark time. Like I said, because of uh, the way the sun rotates and the the length of the days during this time of Christmas, you have to watch for the fact that there is more darkness in the days and that it can make you uh, where you get that kind of like, uh, I like to call it the humbug feeling because I always think of Scrooge is a good one that makes you uh, kind of which way. That's because you'll find that around Christmas time, you actually have more people committing suicides, more people doing uh, things, more people feeling depressed. Uh, it is a is a almost a impact or effect that is happening on their bodies, and you have to lighten up their life, lighten up their things around them, put those Christmas ornaments and those things up to remember uh, the hope and and trust that we could put in God to lead our lives. And 
And we say, so the Christmas tree is that, the Santa Claus of this uh, gift giver, this uh, man who was a, uh, is really, we call it Santa Claus, but the comes from uh, St. Nicholas. Uh, the clause part of it is just a shortened version of uh, Nicholas and that he was once even there, the stories that it actually came from one of the early uh, popes who was named Nicholas and we, his pope name was Nicholas and that he did used to go out and give uh, gifts at Christmas time. But the whole idea of Christmas even goes further back to that, even before there was Christianity and they were doing things, they had, would have uh, something they would call um, uh, something like Saturn Musk or something like that. It was uh, something that dealt with Saturn, uh, which is the planet for Capricorn of being able to give gifts at this uh, at this time that we're in. Because remember what the time represents in Santa Claus or Christmas time is a time when you have passed through the darkest period. But for around June 21st, when winter steps in, you start with that darkest day. But it kind of like stays at that level of darkness for about three days. So when you say the 21st, the 22nd, and the 23rd is at its darkest. When it hits the 24th, you it's starting to actually get less. It's starting to uh, less darkness, or in other words, more light. So we're saying that the light actually starts growing on the 24th when we celebrate Christmas. And we see the, the Santa Claus that we believe in is uh, a reminder of the sun and its path. Uh, and that coming down uh, the chimney at this time is uh, the sun uh, coming closer to us because the, the winter is caused by the, it, it's kind of always thought it was kind of like uh, backwards, but it's, but physically it's true that during this time of uh, Christmas that um, Uh, at a time at Christmas that we find that uh, we, we um, the sun is closer, but because of the angle of the sun, it gets colder. So it has come down the chimney and it has gotten colder for us, but uh, that coldness is because of the angle, not because it's down. So Santa Claus coming down the chimney for us is that the sun actually becomes closer to the earth during the winter and going up the chimney for us is when it around june 21st is when the sun is actually farthest from us but because of the angle it is actually warmer um, so we have that idea of that chimney for us is that pathway of the of, of the sun going around and they're coming down the chimney. And so it actually is a time we are actually closer to that uh, Christ spirit uh, when you the sun is closer, uh, even though physically on the planet, it gets colder. Um, so that's just one of the of the, the principles that we look at. Now I did have a note from someone. And for those, you know, I am gonna turn my chat on. If you have, a, a question while I'm talking that you don't want to interrupt me. Uh, there is a uh, there is a chat feature that you have. I don't know exactly how. I know it works on the phone. I think it works on the phone just like a message that you can send a chat mes message and ask the question uh, that you type just type into the chat. Or in a minute, I will give you some time to do it. But I do have a message from one person, uh, not from the chat, but the message that was written to me that asked me, what are the seven principles of perfection? What are the seven principles of perfection? And uh, with, the, with that question, there are a couple of ways to look at what those uh, seven principles of perfection are. I know in our lessons, we talk about um, the seven principles are a part of the tree of life, but the tree of life there are uh, three principles that are on top of the tree. And then there are, if you uh, add to those three principles that are at the top of the tree that forms one triangle, you have two more triangles and uh, uh, another circle at the bottom. 
that often those seven principles that are at the lowest part of the tree are uh, seven principles of perfection. We also, we have what we call the seven uh, double letters. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, but they are sectioned off into three different um, categories. Uh, one category is the three mothers, and just like I talked about the three at the top, they, the, that three can be considered to relate to that. Then there are the 12 simple letters, uh, which are very much like the 12 signs of the zodiac. And so when you add that together, there are seven letters that are left, and they are called the seven double letters uh, of the uh, of the 22 letters of the of uh, the Hebrew alphabet. And those seven principles of uh, of that of that uh, double letters are often considered to be the creative spirits, the seven creative spirits. They're double because when you talk about uh, they they're being complete. They're they're dual. They have a dual meaning. They have a a a positive side or an, and a, a negative side, or a uh, good side and an evil side to each one of those seven principles. Because they're just creative principles. They, a creative principle can either build or it can destroy. And so it has those seven principles, and those principles are. Uh, wisdom, uh, health, uh, fruitfulness, life, power, peace, and beauty are seven principles that we look at when we look at the um, the double letters of the of the of the Hebrew alphabet. But that seven of perfection, because another way to look at the seven principles of perfection is that it is a combination of the numbers three and four. Three being a number to represent the male quality and four being the, the principle that represents the female because three is a odd number and many uh, most feel that the odd numbers represents masculine qualities and uh, even numbers represent uh, feminine qualities. So the three and the four together uh, make up uh, the bringing together of those and making that come uh, complete, that they've come together and uh, transcended to being a com uh, complete section. Or, and so it becomes purple, perfect. When I, and I'm saying complete, but it's really saying perfect. It's become perfect because it is whole. It has all the qualities that need, all the principles that need to make a complete system. Are there, and I'll pause for a minute. Are there anyone else have any questions or comments? Well, because it would seem now we're talking more about Christmas principles. We talked a little bit about uh, Santa Claus and relating Santa Claus to the sun, uh, his jolliness. Again, we've talked a lot about this is a time for inspiring people to, to, uh, to be happy, to look for that evergreenness, that joy that is going to come as you're going through a system. Uh, and, you know, we can talk about the whole, a lot of things where we talk about even, and the way we're even looking at, at it with the, the red and the white head of, of his suit is actually looking at that principles because there's more red in a suit than there's white in a suit. And we see that again as showing that light has, has dwindled down, but it's going to start growing. Uh, the his boots that represents material understanding those black boots that he wears, um, uh, the beard representing his wisdom, uh, the hat that he wears uh, is another symbol of uh, wisdom. Uh, sometimes that that little floppy pointed hat we think of it as a dunce cap, but it actually is a, a weird when you see wizards. Wiz, you know, it's kind of funny that we use a thing called a dunce cap. But when you see a wizard, it's often we will see a wizard with that same type of pointy hat on him. So it is another symbol of uh, gaining wisdom from uh, from from the higher planes coming down on you when you have that type of uh, pointy hat that Santa Claus has on. Um, what are some of them symbols? About? We talk about the reindeer that represent the the, the swiftness of foot, the uh, uh, of fleetness. Uh, from the the, the 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 reindeer, we have uh, you know it's just so many symbols the, that we use as uh, ways of 
giving us inspiration about higher qualities that people can have, uh, like the even the 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 slave representing that it's still like a basket or a holder for things, and all even the Santa Claus's satchel that he has. Uh, that holds things and kind of like we believe that, you know, you can reach in and pull out whatever you need, the gifts that you need from that statue. But all of these for us are spiritual lessons of higher things that we need to remember about higher consciousness. But I'll pause for a minute and see, does anyone else have any questions or comments? I got a, uh, something that came to me as you were talking about. Um, the male and the, fe the, the the masculine and the feminine. Yeah, and that's uh, Saint Teresa for those who don't can't see the screen. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, something came to me like when you were explaining it, and it was it was like uh, when a a man a lady and a a man and a woman uh, get together and they have a a kid. Yes, that was yes. the the idea that came to me when you were explaining that. Yes, because it it's like you come the two come together and they make a whole another person. <laughs> yes, and, and I didn't say wow. you caught that I would, I would be saying that because when we talk about a man and a woman having sex, it actually is under the number uh, six. Uh, so for them coming together as two people, it actually represents number six. When they have the child, they become the number seven. So yes, wow. there's, a, uh, <laughs> so there's, there, there's a, so much that has been uh, of higher knowledge that are in some of the simple things that we see around us of them bringing forth and becoming whole, making uh, coming together to become one. Anyone else have any thoughts or questions or comments? Good morning. Good morning. It's Mother Loretta, I think. Yeah, Mother Loretta. I was just going to say around this time of the year, it, when you were talking about the lights, it is the time of the year when people are depressed. And when they feel that way, a lot of times they don't put up decorations or don't put up the tree. But you notice on the news we're hearing about people killing each other and accidents and maybe suicides. People commit suicide. But when we have the Christmas tree and you feel yourself down and low with those lights, I would sit and just look from the top of the tree all the way to the bottom and see the lights flashing. And I have the house decorated. So in case, you know, you might not feel like being bothered with Christmas or you might not want to celebrate, but when you have those decorations and the pretty lights going, whatever you may be feeling at that time, if you just sit and meditate and look at those lights and things, it will pull your spirits up. Yes. and help you to have a better attitude. And then this is a time, too, where we have to be careful the way we talk to people and the way we say things. You mm -hmm. know, you, you let them express themselves. And because they're going through some things, everybody don't talk about what they're going through. But a lot of times in life, they're going through so much. And if mm -hmm. you could just uplift them in the way you're talking, and if they don't put up a Christmas tree, tell them to get some lights or something and light up mm -hmm. and have something in their homes that will inspire them to pull their hearts and souls up because this is a depressive time. And it's going to be that way because of the pandemic. Most people can't it's get out. Or yes. you can't get out as much. This is even worse than any other time. So mm -hmm. we really have to work hard to pull each other's spirits up or just uh, text them, call them and talk to them, check on them, see how they're doing. Because it's like a mood of gloom and doom where they get in a stupor. So we really have to kind of pull them up and encourage them and uplift them during this time of year, more so this year. Yes, yes, you we know, have that. So. People have been, uh, a lot of people have been kind of stored away for a while, and now you come to a period where it actually, uh, 
makes you even feel more closed in with not having that those lights out there. And you should go out, like Melora said, uh, put some lights up or go see some lights somewhere. I know we're, we're doing this time of year. One thing I usually like to do is to drive through neighborhoods that or places that they had the lights up. Because I know there are certain places you know where uh, the people put up their decorations that is, and is, uh, especially when they, when I was working, you go to work and you come out of the out of the job and it's already dark by the time you're coming home for work, it is good to go drive through a neighborhood where it's all yeah. lit up and uh, beautiful things are out there to uplift people's mind because you want to have that, like that fern or that evergreen, you want to remember that hope of glory uh, that we all should have in our lives. And people out often lose hope during this time. That's why the, you know, if you can do, like Mother Loretta said, you can say something to them and it just makes them further depressed. Yeah, more little runner, because I know you all some of the things I might have forgot to bring out. Just help me out. Well, you, I, I will, but you brought up out quite a bit, especially mm -hmm. during this time time of year. I know I used to take the children, you know, we would get in the car and I would take them around and mm -hmm. we would um, look at the different houses and look at the different de decorations. They could do that now by us not being able to get out as much and right. we would ride through and tell the children because mm -hmm. I know it's hard for people that have kids and the kids, they don't really understand. They're used to going out and playing and doing stuff and they want gifts regardless of what we have if we can't afford them. They be looking for presents. They don't care what you say. They want a present. Uh -huh. So we yes. have to, and not all the time, it's the gifts under the tree, too. You may not be able to get anything or have anything, but I always have these decorative boxes yes. that I have, and I put them under the tree to create yes. for myself and others. If I don't have the finance to get, or if I'm not able to get a gift, I put those under the tree to demonstrate Mm -hmm. That, you know, it is gift given and you will have things, even just put the spirit and the heart of it in each one of those packages and put those under the tree. And they come mm -hmm. in and they say, oh, God, you got a lot of gifts. They don't know it's not a thing in them boxes. <laughs> <laughs> them boxes under there. But what, I'll get something it later on. Spirit, yes, it brings that, that spirit. Because we look at these dollar things, spirit. That's why I said, think of your Christmas tree just like it was a burning bush and that it was a holy ground. Like it's an altar, it's another altar in your house. And the altar is made to be a, just like I said, the sleigh is a receptacle. The the Christmas tree should be like a receptacle. When I get gifts, uh, even before Christmas, even by opening up, I like to put them under the tree and let it bring some of those spiritual blessings uh, right. uh, through the prayers that you in you know in, you know have with the tree and and not saying again saying not saying you're worshiping the tree but you're worshiping the fact that God can give you spiritual blessings and you need to have a, and you create a place that is a lot of like this sacred place where God can help fill you with the blessings the blessings that you need now and the blessings that you would really need later so it's that hope. I like I said, that hope of glory and just see those the the light uh even from above the tree pouring down into that shape of the tree and coming down and blessing you with the gifts. Um, but go ahead, Mother Loretta. I'm I'm No, that's it. I'm done. I just oh. wanted to mention that because I remember mother always saying during this time of the year you just watch people because they're depressed and they commit suicides and a lot of murders happen. So mm -hmm. we just have to, you know, try to uplift them and inspire them so they'll have, you know, a sense of 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 uh, love and hope and yes. that things will work out for them because you could really get depressed, but you still have hope. You got to have that hope and God will pull you through. Just like you say, the tree is endurance. Mm -hmm. It is. And God will pull you through not only for this time of year, but any other time, too, if we just have that faith and hope he'll pull us through yes anyone else like to share their thoughts about christmas time uh, I, I remember as a child um people didn't have much mm -hmm. but they gave I, I remember as you all were talking i remember people used to give like like fruit you get fruit um you get something to eat mm -hmm. <laughs> You get like cookies or 
uh, homemade candies, like yes. um, stuff like that. It, so you never really felt felt like you didn't get anything. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, if people would give you stuff to eat, and yeah. as a That's kid, true. you'd be like, I mean, something to eat was better than uh, than really a toy. <laughs> If you mm -hmm. think about it, because yeah. you, I, I don't quite remember the toys that I got, but I remember that people they, I remember um, people giving food mostly, mm -hmm. um, food items like baked goods or of or, or fruits. Or, mm -hmm. I remember um, somebody one time gave us some oranges. Mm. Oh my God, those were the sweetest <laughs> oranges. <laughs> I remember. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, sometimes you don't have the money to buy toys. And really and truly, kids, yeah. they tear up toys. Yes. They don't, they don't make them last long. Mm -mm. But, but something that you maybe baked or something that you may have made, uh, something that you, a uh, fruit or uh, item like that, that lasts longer in a kid's mind. Mm -hmm. A toy that you may have given. Yeah, and 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 put some of those symbols on it. You can make some cookies and put little. That's true. Put yeah, sprinkles put some, on it. Put sprinkles on it, or some kind of uh, uh, what do you call it stuff? Um, whipped cream or something uh, to just mm -hmm. decorate it, and then let that person know that they're, they'll inspire their hope within them, because that's the most important part of uh, of this time of year of that hope of the Christ being born in your life. Uh, that light of the Christ coming into your life. This is a time when people need to be remembered, uh, you know, reminded of that, of that, uh, of that birth of uh, the Christ. Uh, and even the story of Jesus teaches us that. That that's why it's kind of said he was born uh, in a manger. For us, that manger is coming to this period of uh, this low period of, of consciousness. That uh, born in this manner, uh, manger with the animals when they're in that low period, that this Christ light is still there for them to be a part of it. Is there others? Because another thing I didn't mention it was about the the songs, the Christmas songs. Um, I know I was laughing at my wife the other day because she watched the um, what's this the Disney Christmas sing along. Uh, but you need that kind of uplifting songs uh, the and uh, she looked at another one uh that was really good um uh what was it the holly dolly or the dolly holly christmas or something like that i think dolly parton just put out a christmas album and she was saying right, right. it about her i like you want those type of things to try to inspire people to hope and like i said in most of the christmas stories uh, even though they start off in these terrible situations um uh, to where people are in the sad conditions, like Scrooge and like um, it's a wonderful life. I think the one that has uh, uh, the when he look, they, they had this small this um, savings and loan, and he loses everything. And then the people of but at the end of it, the people of the community come and and uh, and show him that they love him enough to be able to do that. People need that hope now because they are in those type of mindsets when you feel that there is no um, there is no answer, there is no hope. Uh, the light is going, I'm feeling depressed, I'm feeling lonely, and we need to be able to do things to brighten up those people's lives. Well, you can even also turn on, on your your TV and they have Amazon and with the music, you could turn on different um uh, channels on there and they have where they play the music all day long just turn your volume up have mm -hmm. the music going all day because that'll inspire you and you know give you hope too when you hear that music and things going on and the different movies that they're playing mm -hmm. i know like Teresa said if you didn't always have money with me what i would always do i would always bake and i would have cookies and i would buy mm -hmm. get like the little tin cans and mm -hmm. give them give the kids cookies they will rather have something like that with the cookies in the can if the can is already decorated i will mm -hmm. make the cookies or make little cakes or cupcakes mm -hmm. but i haven't been able to do that this year because my oven went out so i have to 
<laughs> get a get a stove soon, and that's what's killing me. Cause I usually be, you know, I be and bake something around November. Have a big tin of cookies and stuff like that. So um, next year I'll do that. But that's that's always a good idea. Just like she said, the children be looking for food, mm-hmm. and if you give them that, even when I I had didn't have gifts, I would make sure. During that time, I would get like a gift card and give mm-hmm. them like a five dollar gift card where they could go to. They would like McDonald's or like Burger King or something like that. Give them something, and boy, they would be excited just from there where they could go and get something like that. That mm-hmm. was a gift for them. So it's a lot of things that you know we didn't have much, but those were the best times of the year when we mm-hmm. didn't have much. You would even get maybe like a a pair of socks. Yes. If that's all you could get or a ball, just the little things that Something we would done. get that would inspire so much. Mm-hmm. All right, a ball. You are so right. A <laughs> <ball>. <laughs> I remember one year my my parents got us a tether ball. Oh wow. Right. Oh, my <laughs> God. That was the best gift. And uh, we went and tied it out there on the post because we had a post right that was right next to our house. And man, we had the most fun with that tether ball. Tether ball, just yes, getting, just getting kids a ball. That was a great thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You had to, yeah, because I remember, I remember when the school used to have those tether balls. That used to be a big thing to do. Going to in the morning at Ponciana, and um, um. Play tether ball before people used to come to school. Before class. Yeah, before class to go out there and play tether ball. <laughs> ball and I ball. remember after after the after the ball, we played it so the ball burst. <laughs> after that, we took a a bleach bottle <laughs> and put it on a string and played tether ball with the bleach bottle or a milk. A milk bottle. Yeah. Man, that used to be the game. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. It's good yeah. to remember those. I had forgotten about that. <laughs> yeah. Best time. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, just to let y'all know, it's a new Christmas movie out, a new black Christmas movie out called Jingle Jangle. I don't know if y'all watched it. Everybody it's good. I saw it. I saw it too. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. I, I finally saw it too. Uh, with yeah, the, and then a lot yeah. of um, if you look at um, BET now, BET is starting to have a lot of uh, black family Christmas movies. Um, I don't know if everybody has a station. It's a station called Inspire. Inspire. Yeah. We have it here in Atlanta. They have like a whole bunch of different. Uh, black Christmas movies, just similar to like how Hallmark and um, what's that other channel with the uh, Hallmark channel have a lot of Christmas movies, but they started yeah. to have other channels with black family Christmas movies on mm-hmm. it too. Yeah. What's the name of the channel? Uh, it's called, well, up here, in the, it's, I don't know if it's just an Atlanta channel, but it's called Inspire. I'm oh, outside. I think we have that. I got to look for that. They have all kind of African American programming on it. Um, they're good. And then there's another channel, TV One, which is owned by Kathy Hughes, who who does Radio One. They have all kind of um, African American content, and they usually replay all of the um, old um, sitcoms. You know, like. Uh, the Cosby show and all those black TV shows that came out in the nineties and stuff. They replay a lot of those. Um, so you got TV one, you got aspire and, um, BET sometime has stuff. So I usually am on their stations all the time around Christmas time, looking at all the black family movies and they're really good. It's almost like, um, what's that station? Everybody watch. Usually they play the TV shows about the women. Um, Lifetime? The, yeah, the Lifetime. Music? It's like that. Oh. That's kind of how they have. Um, but they have like African American stories. I know Aspire does. And they don't necessarily only have Christmas stuff during the regular time. They have all kind of other like African American stories where they get, you know, black actors and stuff together. Some of the stories are pretty good. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, yeah a couple learning. of times is, you know, always want to put up a little decoration or something. I actually wanted to put my stuff up early just because of all the stuff that was happening with the pandemic. So I started putting up stuff right after um, Halloween. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, no. It's, it's, you know, you see it and it makes you feel better and stuff like does. that. So, no, it's, a, it's so a, oh, a, tell them what Miss Glenda used to do with you all. Oh, uh, Miss Glenda, which is our neighbor, she used to do this thing where um, she would have all the kids in the neighborhood come and we would make um, monkey bread for our family. So each mm. family, she, you you would have to, I think we had either she provided the stuff or we provided, I can't remember, but um, she would have all the kids in the neighborhood. We would come to her house. She would already have all her Christmas decorations um, up and you would make monkey bread for your family. She showed us all how to do it. And that would be like a thing that she would do with all the kids in the neighborhood. Mm. And she would, you know, help us. We, we put it together and she'll show us all the steps. And then we would bake it at her house and then you would take it home to your family. And that was kind of like one of the Christmas gifts that she gave uh, all the kids in the neighborhood, you know, and Malcolm, he carried on that tradition. I mean, well into like high school, he would still, even when all the rest of us had gone to college and stuff, Malcolm would still go over to Miss Glenda house and make a monkey bread, even Mm -hmm. when he was like in high school. (laughs) But uh, we only all. Malcolm would would not tell us, and he would eat it all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was it was rare that you got a a piece of the monkey bread that Malcolm <laughs> made. And by the time you got it, it almost was crusty and hard because he only had a little bit left. Because he done sat there and ate the whole thing. <laughs> And by the time you get it, you only get in the leftover part that he just couldn't finish. <laughs> and she used to do sometimes uh-huh. she used to do um uh red velvet cakes too. She would oh, uh really? let us all come over there and she would kind of show us all the stuff to do to make the red velvet cake. And mm-hmm. then you would take it, or she would bake the whole family if you if we didn't come over and do it. She would uh, bake your family a red velvet cake every year. And that was the thing that she would do. Every year we would get a red velvet cake. And one year she did uh, blue red velvet cakes and it was pretty good mm. too. So mm. yeah, Ma, that is true. You kind of remember stuff like that. Related she did different food. colors of the red velvet recipe. That's what she did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, okay. I think it was the still same cake. She just used blue one year instead of different red. coloring. Right, mm-hmm. different co- yeah. food coloring, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because yeah, it's actually the bitterest color, I think. Because I, <laughs> like my mama said, I don't. I remember some presents that people got us, but I never forget all of that stuff that Miss Glenn used to have us coming over there cooking and helping her with. And we had like a lot of kids in the neighborhood. It was like a if if all of us together, it would be a good twenty to twenty five of us. Over wow. There when it comes to people in the neighborhood. Um, plus her, like she had nieces and nephews and stuff like that and cousins and stuff. And all of us used to hang out together. And then Mm. we got pictures of like big groups of all of us just being together at her house. And most of the time, if people weren't at Miss Glenda's house, they were at our house. So my mom used to always have houses full of kids all the time, or we would be outside playing. And I remember one year, um, my mom bought us a trampoline. Oh, no. I mean, everybody in the neighborhood used to be on that trampoline <laughs> all the time. We didn't even have to be home and people were on the trampoline. And it was a big trampoline. They start talking about a little trampoline. They yeah. talking about a full size, uh, a um, full size 20 foot trampoline. trampoline. When I went to college, I had invited all these friends. I had invited like maybe like 10 friends home one year, two from college. And we all stayed at my parents' house. It was, I don't know what we were thinking, but it, it, it was fun. It was a nice trip. And we did that for spring break. And one of the nights, all the kids, we ended up, now grown college students, about six or seven of us laying out and sleeping on that trampoline one night. <laughs> <laughs> under, the, under the stars and all that stuff. Oh my goodness. So nice. The person, the only person who had the trampoline was daddy. Daddy hated that trampoline. Yes. 
when it told me five it wasn't yeah to me it wasn't safe because it no you know it was there's no fence around it so any time of the day like she said there would be kids that would come and get on that trampoline and uh, unsupervised <laughs> um, i mean it only took for one leg to break and daddy took the whole thing down, turn it down yes <laughs> She said, well, one day, how many legs got to break before you take down the trampoline? Daddy, you, we could have got another one, but you was not happy. You hated that trampoline. You wanted it down before it was, was that it got messed up. <laughs> it wasn't protected. It wasn't had, protected. You all had fun. I'm, that's all I wanted. Mm -hmm. Y'all have some fun. I remember, Mom, I remember we made a music video on the trampoline. Oh, one surely time. did. And yeah, that was in the I early days of those cameras, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, the whole neighborhood, one of the people in the neighborhood got a video camera or something, and we played some music, and they made, came up with, like, flips and dance routines and stuff like that that we made off of this song. And it, the trampoline was involved, and people were flipping. It was Now, who knows what that tape is, but it was a very fun thing that we put together a, a music video production <laughs> on the <laughs> trampoline. So we used to have some good times. And that was yeah, like that was the trampoline from Christmas, so it lasted. <laughs> it, lasted it lasted a long. It lasted a couple years, and I think it just kind of got rusted from being outside because we didn't have a cover or anything over it, which we probably should have had a cover or something. The cover that probably would have kept kids off of it, Daddy, when you weren't there. But you know, we just didn't know. And then I think our house always had something that all the kids wanted because before we had the trampoline, we had a. Uh, a portable basketball goal. Mm -hmm. All the kids would come over and play basketball at our house all the time because there was a lot of kids in the neighborhood who loved basketball. And we were the only one of the only houses, maybe one or two houses, and we were the only house that had like a portable one, and we could push it anywhere and, and make it play all day. But yeah, we used to have some good times in our neighborhood. <laughs> And this, is, and this is a time for remembering the good times because, like I said, people, uh, and a lot of times people don't know they're depressed uh, and they'll just keep mulling over those uh, sad thoughts. And you have to remind them that know that there is a God in heaven, there is a glory that you can get in your life. And you just, sometimes you have to, like you said, you have to make that glory like a gift that you give, that you can share with others the, um, the glory you find inside of you. Anyone else? Because we haven't got to the lesson yet. <laughs> we just talked about that fern and Christmas. But I, one of the reasons I put that fern in there, because I kept saying, oh, I need to talk a little bit about Christmas time. I need to talk about a little bit of Christmas time. And uh, when we first got into Sagittarius, and I kept forgetting, I said, you know something, I'm going to put that this fern, uh, because it looks like a Christmas tree, to remind myself to talk about Christmas, because it's so important that people, especially if people remember that this is a time for inspiring joy in people because that glory of the Christ is coming. So anyone else before we go on? Think about it, glory is coming. Yes, yes. And new president is coming. <laughs> And we say a new president. I think this is a. a Just to throw that in. No, and, and I, no, it's good because I think it's going to be a new time is coming, and we all we all need to realize it's a new time. That's why for our lesson, what I chose was this. Um, now, in the story in the Korean Gospel, they're actually talking about the coming of the new age, um, and this is the Council of the Seven Sages. They were coming together because they knew a new age was coming in. And they wanted to try to kind of get an idea on how they wanted to get people to think. Um, and uh, for those things on the screen, I have the, the the first part of that 56th chapter of the Korean Gospel. And I think I only did about 16 verses of it. It's not the whole whole uh, thing. Maybe 20 verses. I can't remember on the second. Well, let me look at the second page. It's only going to do 14 verses of um, of um, of the lesson. But in the first chapter, or the first part of it, it says, in every age since time began, had seven sages lived. At first of every age, these sages meet 
to note the course of nations, people, and tongues. To note how far towards justice, love, and righteousness the race has come. And I want to stop there for a minute. We're in the third verse. To note how far towards justice, love, and righteousness the race has come. Now, I talked about this earlier, but it was before the recording, so I'm going to talk about it again, that what does it mean here by the word race? Because to me, we need to get a, a better or spiritual understanding of, of race. Because the word race, I think a lot of times when we use it, we think about it and we think that it comes from the same word when we're doing a competitive race or running race. And the word race doesn't actually even come from the same root as that. So we need to start thinking of the same because when we start thinking about races, uh, we start thinking about these competing ethnic groups. And that's not where the word race comes from. Race comes from a root that means family. And the reason I said that that's a totally different spiritual concept when you think of family, when we think of race, we think about what separates people. And yet the word race actually talks about what makes people join together as one, what makes them feel a part of uh, the same, uh, uh, you know, the sameness between them. So to me, when it's talking about race here, it's talking about family. So how far has the family grown? Not the individual, but how far has the whole family grown? So, and spiritually, what it's telling us is that there are sages or there are wise men uh, that are at least seven uh, uh, always on the planet that are looking at how far the whole human family has grown and what steps it can take to actually move them towards a better concept of what justice is, what love is, and what righteousness is. But on a the course of nations, people, and tongues. And I think we're in a time, it, it said tribes and tongues, but we're in a time where the whole planet is going through a big change, is going through uh, into a, a, a new age. And I see this as a time when we have to think about where is the family, the race going, the, the whole human family, where is it going? Has it gotten closer to justice, love, and righteousness? And the strange thing I think about it is that from some of the things that I'm seeing around that the human family is growing in its consciousness, even though because of the change, we have a lot of people who are of that old mindset who are giving us a lot of problems and a lot of friction from letting the human grace, race or human family grow towards more justice, more love and more righteousness. It's uh, Even though it's a pandemic and a disease, it's making us see that we need to work together as a family, as a people to uh, work to fight against this, to heal ourselves from it, but it needs to be not just saying, oh, I as an individual uh, just want enough protection for myself. We need to think of how can we actually have the whole family or as much as the family as possible saved from these things is a lesson I think we're showing. So I think we're at a, a point that is much like at the beginning of the ages where the seven sages, the perfect uh, complement of people come together to be able to do that. So that's again, but when we again, when we talk about race in and here, we'll be going to talk about that family of people coming together to work together to make things better for us all. And looking at mankind and looking to see are we moving closer to ideas of justice, love, and righteousness as a whole family. So it says that these uh, they're together to note that, and it says to formulate the code of laws, religious postulates, and plans to rule best fitted for the coming age. So if we go into this new thing, we need to think about how what how can what kind of rules we need now. If we're going to get closer to uh, this laws of, of 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 justice, love, and righteousness. We need to start thinking some of the old concepts that we had put into this 
concept of justice, this concept of what is love, and this concept of what is righteousness, that we have to let those codes, the old way we were doing those codes, and the old feelings that we were having about the postulates that form religion, we need to rethink them and start thinking on them on a higher spiritual level. In the fifth verse, it says, an age has passed and lo, another age has come. The sages must, must convene. It says, now Alexandria was the center of the world's best thought. And here Philo, home of the sages, and here in Philo's home, the sages met. So it's saying the Aquarian gospel is saying that Alexandria at the time was sort of like the center of world thought at that time. Now, Alexandria is a part of uh, Egypt. It's the part of Egypt where Alexander the Great uh, formed a city. And it's saying that at that time, that was sort of like the center of it because that had the, the first big library uh, was in Alexandria. What Alexander the Great did is that one in Egypt, they had temples that were scattered all across e Egypt uh, that had were, and the temples to me, you think about temples in, universe, in, in, in Egypt, you almost have to think about them as universities. They were places, yes, they were places of worship, but they were also a place of knowledge about certain topics restored. And with Egypt, a, a temple would be, would be devoted to a certain topic. And when Alexander uh, the Great came there, one of the things he wanted to do is he didn't want to have to travel all over Egypt to get access to all of this knowledge and this learning. So what he did is uh, with the books and the things that have been written about these various topics, he wanted them all in one place. And that was his city of Alexandria uh, with the library that started in Alexandria. So that's why I say that it was the center of the world's best thought, because then when he had this place in Alexandria that had the, the books and the knowledge from Egypt, they started saying, well, we need to get knowledge and wisdom from all over the world and put it into one place. And that's what Alexandria became in its library. It became a place that they started getting books and writings and knowledge from all over the world to come together in one place to have it. And, I, and I'm talking about that because I'm saying even at this age, one of the things we need to do is try to get information from all over the world and not think about it as just being for just us one, but how do we get it all together to start coming up with the best ideas that we need to need it from all over uh, the world and working together and sharing that information and seeing how we can make it better, especially on the topic of a uh, pandemic. We need the input and the help from all over the world. Because I mean, one of the, probably one of the uh, greatest and saddest things I saw from the standpoint of China, which they keep saying was the, was the place that started this, that when China had the, uh, got the virus, they did what they called that DNA coding of it. And when they got that code, instead of just keeping it for themselves, they actually shared it. They put it out on the internet for all the scientists to look at. Now, it was the scientists in the big city, I mean, the big countries like America and in uh, Germany, and in England, that they started taking this information and they used it to come up with these cures, but uh, and then in a way almost wanted to cut China out that they wouldn't uh, they didn't they weren't sharing their data uh, of the cure with China and China actually started trying to hack into some of their machines to to get the answers. But if you see what China did, that idea that this is a family problem, that the human family is in a problem and that we need the help of whoever is in that family that has the resources to come up with that answer, we need them to help work on that answer. Uh, even though when their countries got them, they went into their business mode of, oh no, we're just gonna do it and see how much money we can make off of it. But going back to the Korean gospel uh, in the seventh verse, it says, from China came Minsink, uh, from India, Viapati came. From Persia, Casper came, and from Assyria, Abini, Asbini, Bina came. From Greece, Apollo, Mentero, Mentero I'm sorry, Matino was uh, the Egyptian sage, and Philo was the chief of Hebrew thought. 
So they were meeting at the house of the of the sage who was from Hebrew thought. But you'll see that it talks about at that time that was the entire world and uh, China uh, was one of the places: India, Persia, uh, Assyria, Greece, and Egypt. Uh, and uh, from the from Jerusalem were the places that all these sages had come. Even though Philo, who was the Hebrew sage, uh, must have been living in Alexandria at the time, but you had all of them from all over the world these sages coming together to come up with the answer to the questions. But th since the time was due for it, the council met and sat in silence for seven days. It said the council, when they first met, that these seven men from all over the world came together, but the first thing they de did was for seven days, they sat not saying anything. Now, we're not just sitting and saying anything, but uh, they were in silence. And one of the reasons I wanted to, I'm, I'm emphasizing that point, is uh, even something Mother Loretta said, is sometime sit in front of the tree and what? In silence, calm down. Uh, one of the first things you need to do if you wanna be blessed sometime is calm down. And so it's to, to, for them, these masters did it for even actually seven days. But sometimes, you know, can you do it for uh, seven seconds? Can you do it for seven minutes? Uh, can you do it for, for no, but try to work for, for a while that you sit and say, first, I need to calm myself down. I need to settle myself down and I need this period of silence to uh, especially when I'm looking uh, at these things that I'm looking at, that I just want to take and silently reflect on it for a while so I can actually come to realize the that God within me. Uh, like the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. That's still that silence. Sometimes we need to silence all of the, of the uh, thoughts and all of the, the problems that we say we have and just sit in try to silence them for a while, silence them for a minute uh, or two or whatever time it takes you, but first get into that silence so that you can receive the thoughts. I'm going to pause there. Are there any questions or thoughts? As we're talking about this Council of the Seven Sages and comparing it to where we are now, that there's a new age coming and what you need to do at that new age when it's coming in. And part of it is you need to set, sit in silence so you can become accepting to the new ideas that are coming. Because I think new ideas are coming, new ideas are growing. And we have to accept the newness of those ideas and accept the fact that some of this, the people uh, are going to change their concepts of life, of how to be together, of what they can do in this new age. But any comments? I think I heard someone unmute themselves. Does someone have a comment? I didn't see who that was. Or maybe they muted themselves. But if not, we'll go on uh, to the next section of it. Like I said, we're only going to do 14 verses. And uh, in this ninth verse in the 56th chapter, 56th chapter of the Aquarian Gospel, ninth verse says, And then Minsik arose and said, The will of time has turned once more. The race, and I'm going to say family, the family is on a higher plane of thought. So it's saying that now that this will has turned, the whole family is on a higher plane of thought. The fabrics that our, uh, that should be our, the fabrics that our fathers wore has given out. And I wanna pause on that. The fabrics or garments that our fathers wore, wove have given out. So it's saying that old way of thinking is worn out. 
old way of doing things had worn out in that age. They had used it up. And I think we're in a period where some of that uh, ideas, the old ideas, are showing that they are worn out, that they do not work anymore, and that people don't actually accept them anymore. And I say that because when we look at some of the things happening now, it was one time when the things that are being said now that people laugh at and think are jokes, at one time, they worked. At one time, uh, people saw that and they would either just shine away, you know, uh, they, you know, it was like one time they, it was a big thing about, oh, you can't fight City Hall or uh, when you see these type of things where people, who oh, rich people, what they say has to go. That at one time, the mindset of people was that you didn't even fight against it. You didn't try to vote against it. Uh, and now you're seeing when they're coming out and saying some of these things and they're trying to do things that um, are, 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 are and at one time would just accept it as that's the way life is, that people are looking at it and saying, you must be crazy if you think that people are going to accept that. And I think part of that is that that old garment uh, that our fathers uh, had wove. And remember, this is something that you weave. This is something that people get and they take uh, the the fabrics that the that we get from the spirit and they weave them into these garments that they wear. Uh, and the garments we're talking about is these psychological attitudes that they have, these uh, ways they think, look, ways of looking at life. But after a while, the things that they have done to these fabrics actually wear out and people begin to look at them and start seeing them as, you know, what you're talking about uh, is not the way it has to be. And then the same verse in the 10th verse that this says, says, it says, the garments that our fathers wove have given out. The cherubim have woven celestial cloth, has placed it in our hands, and we must make for, man, for men new garbs. And remember, that's why I said I was using this song, Hark the Herald's Angel, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And I like to say it different, because usually the song, the way the song read, it is Hark the Herald's Angels Sing. And with some, to me, a lot of times when I sing that, I don't take the word herald as being a, um, I think as an adver adjective modifying angel. But I think you should look at it as talking about the herald angels. So it's hawk the herald angels sing. And the herald angels are the angels who are, the heralds are the ones who bring messages, who bring things. They're like delivery angels. So it's saying hawk the delivery angels are singing. And I think that's what it's talking about here when it talk about the cherubim. Because when we look at what do we consider the cherubim to be? And if we had listened to uh, a bit apart of the sessions that our Supreme Father Marshall gave in the Ten High Holy Days, we'll see that the cherubims are near the uh, uh, are on that ninth level of the ten, and that the and the tenth level, the one below that, uh, the level um, that is like the earth, is the cherubim working with the elementals. So here I see this is actually looking at that plane, that plane of the tent plane, that plane of the kingdom that we live in, that is talking about that these cherubim of these the divine things or these herald angels, that these delivery angels are giving us a celestial uh, cloth. Uh, so it's telling us that this cloth that we get to fabricate this actually is in heavenly cloth and that they make this cloth, but they just make it as a cloth that they well they they weave it into a celestial cloth but then they have to place it into the hands of man to actually to make clothes from it so we're getting this new cloth that comes from heaven from these cherubim but what is going to happen to that cloth are we going to allow the new cloth we have to be wo woven into the same fabric 
into the same idea ideas and the same mindset that it was in the past because as many of them that that's what they wanted to do they see something new is coming but they said no let's make it the way it was in the past the way that we wove it in the past let's make it like that again and i think what we have to do in our minds as a saying is no that was then this is now we want to make some new rules on what justice is we want to make some new rules on what righteousness is we want to do something different with this new cloth that has been fabricated for the human family and this lesson is telling us that that is within our right within our power to do some new things with these celestial cloth with these herald angels or these delivery angels have uh, preparing for us letting us know that in these times we can expect new ways of thinking we don't have to uh let it or uh, new ways of wo wo of, of uh, weaving the cloth together we don't have to weave it in like it was before and we shouldn't because we can look at what it was before and said that we don't want a cloth that's woven again that is uh mean-spirited we don't have to weave a cloth today that is uh, trying to oppress people. Uh, in fact, we don't see the value of having to oppress people to think that we're going to get the most out of life depending on how many people that we can oppress. That type of thinking is an old type of thinking. We don't need a type of leader who feels that he has to, that leader is on one level uh, of, of life and then all the other people uh, don't get anything. We don't have to weave a cloth where even the rich feel uh, are in a situation that they don't feel, that they feel that they are part of a, a different family unit. They are part of this same family unit and we need to know how we can make them be a contributing factor to the whole family unit or an inspiration. And that's not saying, like I'm saying, I don't think we don't need rich people because there will always be people who are on a higher level, but we need to be able to have that mindset that on what, no matter what level of income you're on, you are part of the same family. And it needs to be so that all members of the family are getting the resources they need to live a happy life. It shouldn't be that the only people who can find happiness are the rich. That's the whole concept. We want to have it that only the rich should be able to find happiness. Only the rich be able to um, have the things that they value in life. Or should we, can we have a way that everybody has the things that are valuable to life, like health care, uh, like food on the tables, like a job that is paying you a decent wage. Let's use this new time to weave a, a fabric that does not say that for you to be rich, you should be the ones who have happiness and that we will just accept the fact that poor people are going to have a hard time in life. That is not the fabric that we have to use if we're in a higher consciousness. We should have the consciousness that you know even when we were talking today about we didn't have a lot and yet we find ways to do things that made our children feel that they could still be happy why do we want to have just because a family is at a lower level of income that we feel that the children of that family has to be sad has to be morose has to be living in conditions that you do, you know, uh, I know I keep teasing my, teasing my wife about it. Uh, sometimes they look like they let dogs life matter more than us. They'll feel sad about seeing a dog living in a bad condition. But when they look at human beings, they think that, oh, but no, some human beings should live in the bad conditions. No, we don't have it where even the poor have to live in sad conditions because you can do things. Even you said with the poor, they, you, the children can even just appreciate food. In fact, sometimes the rich kids are worse because they don't even appreciate the things that they have and they go and look at how they can be uh, more destructive and actually for them to feel that they are great. That type of fabric in the human consciousness uh, or, or weaving that fabric into those patterns is something that I think that we need to get away from. 
and see how we can weave a better fabric for all to live. In the 10th, 11th verse, it goes on to say when it's talking about weaving this new garb, this new garment out of the heavenly fabric we have, say the sons of men are looking for a greater light. And as sense saying this, we knew we need to be looking at a greater light. No longer do they care for God sewn out of wood and made of clay. They seek a God made, not made with hands. And so this is them saying back at that time, they were seeking this God. They were seeking this holiness uh, of something that they had to have some wood or clay that was for them. And we look at now, we'll see that a lot of people, they don't have that idea anymore. Because remember, this is the last age. This is talking about a meeting of the sages at the beginning of the um, of the Piscean age. And we believe that we're coming into a new age. And so it's saying that one of the things that they were doing when they were coming together at the beginning of the Piscean age is trying to get the human family to grow out of this um, uh, feeling that for it to be their God, it had to be something that they could see and feel. It had to be something that was made out of wood and clay. And now we're saying that one of the things they were looking for is that can we now get them to look in mankind to look at a God that is not made by hands? Uh, it goes on to say they see the beams of coming day and they comprehend them not. Because they it's saying they see these beams of light of this coming day, but they don't still comprehend the impact of this new, a uh, higher level of seeing God. And I think that we are in a period where the, we're at higher levels of seeing God as being more than just something before you. And in this 13th verse, it says, the time is ripe and we must fashion well these garments for the race or these garments for the family. So it's saying that when they come together, they had to make sure that they were fashioning the precepts, both religious and those we would use in common day life, the precepts that men could see and do a higher level of God. So it's saying that for this garments that we use for the race, and they're just a garment that we wear for, wear for a while. It says, and this is the 14th verse, the last one we look at, and let us make for men new garbs of justice, mercy, righteousness, and love, that they may hide the nakedness which shines the light of coming day. So it's saying that they have to make this guard for men on the level that mankind is at that time. When these sages met, they saw that they could make this new garb uh, that would give these new definitions of justice, these new definitions of mercy, these new definitions of righteousness and love. That in this coming light of day, when we begin to see that it's not just something that we uh, carve of wood and clay, but talking about that we become, because one of the things that Jesus was talking about, that we become these living temples that we start seeing ourselves as the source of the justice, mercy, and righteousness, and love. Not that it just has to come from uh, uh, the temple uh, statues that we put, that we see ourselves as these living temples, that these living statues, that we become these emissaries of justice, mercy, righteousness, and love. And if you're saying that at the beginning of the passing age, they were already seeing that man is waking up to that consciousness and his ideas. I think now that we're saying that we're actually coming into a new age, that we're saying that we need to take it up. We need to step it up a notch, step it up to a higher level that we can say that individuals uh, can be those what Jesus called the joint heirs in Christ, that we can be jointly part of this consciousness raising of mankind, that we can consciously look at others and know that we don't have to try to oppress and hold others back for us to find joy in life 
And uh, that's why when we were talking about all these things about Christmas time and talking about how uh, we didn't feel that we had much, but we can still find ways to pass joy, that we actually need to think of that type of fabric, that kind of mindset. Can we actually make it a part of the fabric of how mankind moves and see themselves now? But I know I've been talking for a while and I want to give others a chance to speak. So I'm going to ask you a pause now to see are there any comments or questions from the audience or from the other parts of the family are here. And remember, I think we need to really start thinking of when we think about race, start thinking about it from the root of the word. It actually comes from family, that we need to start looking at ourselves as families joining together with families to create this great family, which you call the human race, or I call the human family. But any comments or questions that you'd like to make? I, I just wanted to make a comment. Okay, Teresa. Well, I was just thinking we are going into a new uh, phase, especially with, with um, I'm hoping, with justice mm -hmm. and, and mercy, righteousness, and love. Mm -hmm. If you think about all the 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 hopes that we have that we are putting uh, in Joe Biden mm -hmm. and him and uh, Kamala Harris, um, um, we have a hope that things will be changed around, change mm -hmm. that will be changed for the better, mm -hmm. and maybe a, a whole bunch of this divisiveness and and spewing of hatred mm -hmm. would kind of ramp down uh, when when uh, our, our president now is out of the office. So mm -hmm. we have a hope for that, for, mm -hmm. for new justice, new mercy, righteousness, and love. We have a hope. And, and, and I really do believe that this is the year that all of these injustices and and things laws and everything would change yeah. i really do we have well, a hope uh, of that i think and we have a hope of that, but at the same time you just gotta be hopeful but uh but uh still kind of yeah hopeful with vision yeah because yeah. at the end of the day it's one person and one person can't change a whole bunch of different people with the way they think, because if that was the case, then Obama would have did those things. So I think there's some stuff going to change, but at the same time, we can't put everything on their back. No, that's what I'm saying. The whole family has to change. And I think we don't, right. if we, uh, I, yeah. from my life, see that even Obama created a lot of changes. He did uh, a lot of changes, but at the same time, that's the even people mindset. Because when I look at TV now, I know Teresa and I all, all often comment on it. When you see it, how many black people they have, even putting their voice up on television uh, as part of the conversation, uh, when you see commercials where the commercials are becoming very, very diverse. I remember when they had one of the first diverse commercials, and I think all it was was uh, what was that commercial? Because there was a black man on the couch, and he had like a, a was it a Cheerios or something, or some kind of food. Oh, it was a, him and a little girl it was. And the little girl was mixed, and the wife was white. Right. And they yeah. had such a commotion about that commercial, uh, saying that you know you got an immigrated couple on a in a commercial, uh, and 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 for a while it was going to be like a whole bunch of black in it, but. Then you start saying, instead of having less commercials like that, now they keep having more and more commercials with uh, mixed children and mixed families. And yeah, I think I that sometimes we look at 
we, we look at the backlash from it, know that there, yes, there is backlash anytime you see some of these changes, and but that backlash is actually people trying to go back to get that old woven, uh, uh, woven fabric. But to keep, when you start looking at things, you're saying, no, the fabric is changing. We don't want those old patterns weaved into this new fabric, even though we know that there's still a lot of people, and I'm not talking about a little bit, because when you look at how many people out there who are voting for this, there's still a lot of people who want to try to go back some of the old ways and not saying that, why do you want to create that level of corruption again? Because one of the bad part about some of the old ways is that it was based on corruption, it was based on uh, fear and imposing um, uh, dominance over people. And hopefully with this new fabric we have now, at least, and it just does not work because it's one will be saying that this fabric is woven. That means that there is work for us to do. This is not saying that we can just sit back and watch the fabric being uh, put together and it's gonna become the come together better. No is saying that we have to weave and weave means work. We gotta work this so that it comes out for something higher. Not that you sit back and said, oh, it's just gonna come together. It does not say that. It's saying that the, uh, the Harold angels or the delivery angels, their part in it is to give us a new fabric. Our part in it, in it is that we have to weave better garments out of it. And that weaving means working, not sitting back and just saying, oh, it's going, it's a new fabric, so it has to be better. It does not have to be better. We could uh, just sit back and let the old ways uh, be uh, uh, be woven back into the uh, into the cloth. And we know, say, no, we need to weave better than that. And to weave better than that, means that you have to be out there a part of weaving that fabric. So don't think I'm saying that this is something that we just have to sit back and let the good times roll. No, we need to sit, we need to stand up, roll up our shirt sleeves and start to weaving uh, these better ideas, these better thoughts and this better life. Because it doesn't, uh, yes, I said it starts with silence. But after the silence, after you've taken that moment of silence to look at it and see what's in the path, the part of this service I'm not going, and part of this uh, chapter that I'm not going through, and it's really the next three chapters, all of them say of the sages actually getting together and start putting some of the postures together. I'll start off by looking uh, uh, in the next part, and I think in the other part of this actual chapter, I uh, remember this is in the Quran Gospel, the 56th chapter. If you have time to read on it, you'll see that the next thing that these sages do is each one starts looking at where are where are the people of my area right now? Uh, what problems are they having? And each one goes and gives an idea from each area that they're in. What are the problems in that area? Uh, and after each one then tells what the problem of that area is, then they go into what is the new mindset that needs to take place to get them to a higher level. So this is the beginning of a process of knowing that times are changing and that you need people involved in helping to make the changes. So this is not a time for just saying, sit back and let the good times roll in. This is the time to saying, okay, let's roll up our shirt sleeves and see how we can make a better world. But you know, another thing too, the collective consciousness of the of the whole planet the has made a shift. Yeah. If, if And the ground is fertile now for some shifts to be made. Yes. So, and if you think about it, uh, this is this is the arc that they they often uh, talk about the arc of something that they used to say the arc of humanity or something. What is that thing they say? The arc has is shifting. I think it's the arc of humanity is shifting. It's bending. It's something that Martin Luther King said. 
about the arc, anybody else can think of it the arc of something well anyway there's the, but there's a paradigm shift with the whole um the whole uh mm -hmm. consciousness of the of the of the world yeah. In fact, in the in the in this in this chapter, uh, the verse we have it says the time, the will. It's called the will. The will of time has turned once more. That so it's saying that this is a turn in the will of time. Um, uh, and I, I can't remember. I kind of kind of heard, remember we're saying arc, and I can't remember the exact we're saying. But for this lesson, it talks about it as the will of time is turning. The time is turning. There is a new fabric now. And you have to think about how you're going to weave that fabric into something better and not letting it get stuck in some of those old ways. Because we don't want to, to, some of the things that we did in the old ways, the, the corruption that, in a way, much of that corruption was allowed. Uh, and when I say allowed, uh, when we talk about, you know, they talk about the rule of law and many of the worst things that they did to humanity, they were saying, oh, uh, that was the law of the land. Uh, we don't want that attitude uh, again. We want to make laws that keep justice and harmony as part of them. And just because it's the law, we don't want to see. We won't want to accept um, uh, cruelty and um, and oppression for no reason. Just because it was a law, you're going to accept oppression just because you're saying, "Oh, but that's the law." The if the law says to oppress then is something wrong which you have put into the law. Fix it, get it straight, makes it so that it does not have to oppress people to get uh, the, the best out. Because I don't think that, uh, that your best comes out of you being oppressed. And there's too many ways of way we look at society now that we think that, oh, to get the best out of workers, you have to keep them oppressed. You have to keep them uh, down. Uh, the, uh, that, that's one of the things that we're, one of the worst things that we're having with our our uh, senators now. They think that people are not going to work if they use the tax dollars that the people have put into it to help them to get through this time period. They believe that oh no, you got to uh, you got to make things hard on them. You got to make them where they feel poor and actually to make them work. No. People, I think people will work if they get help through this time. That the people need the help to make it through this time with the tax dollars that uh, you know, because they the, the, it's the tax dollars mostly of the poor, because the rich people try to do everything they can to avoid taxes, even to a point of getting the law, uh, the senators up there and congressmen to reduce the taxes for them at a time when he needed the money to help us get us through these uh, this time period. But we need a new fabric of thought, a new way of thinking, and not this way of thinking that to get people to work, you have to oppress them and you have to make life hard for them. Well, that's why we also need the laws to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the laws are changing because during that time, remember when the laws were made, so many yeah. of the laws, they need to go back in and change the laws. Because mm -hmm. things are changing, and mm -hmm. we as a people, we work. We don't want to sit down on our behinds and wait for handouts. Mm -hmm. We do work yes. because we're pulling up in society, and we, we want to get better things, and we want to do better. We work, we've always worked. Mm -hmm. When we looked around, who were the people that didn't work? <laughs> so we will work and we will continue to work but i don't think it's fair the way that they do and we pay our hard tax dollars and then we can't benefit from anything with no. them they're going to get everything they need as congressmen and senators because they get the best insurance they're going to get the rest of for the rest of their lives they'll mm -hmm. be insured and protected and everything what about the citizens mm -hmm. what about us we deserve better so these things that they're doing now we want change and if mm -hmm. we continue to pray 
and look up. We know that these uh, the president elect and vice president they can't do any everything. They can only do so much. But with the whole universe of people praying and pulling together and class clasping together, we're going to be able to help them pull up where they can make a whole lot of change in the whole universe. Yes. We need to change our, and part of this, when we start changing our thinking on yes. what are the answers. That's right. Because now we have to see people, the way I look at it now with this pandemic, people are getting to be more compassionate. Mm -hmm. We're seeing me, I see people as people, not as a color or race or where they're from. We are all human beings. Mm -hmm. That's one thing we have to do. See people as people and don't be categorizing people. You just see them with souls and people that you want to help and do mm -hmm. for. Yes. And they're coming, becoming more compassionate. We see now we got to help each other. What well, one person will have, if you have two, you try to give the other person some or one of what you have because we have to stick together like a quilt. Mm hmm and when you put, let, that's like when we're making a quilt, you're putting that quilt together and the pieces got to come, but they all have to come together. Each person has to put their square square in their quilt mm -hmm. to help it to form as a quilt. Yeah. So when we start working together and start helping one another like that and our mindset changes, we have to change the mindset. And look at things differently. I, I think we'll be able to uh, make a big change in this universe and in this world, and to help people, and to make this place a better place for all of us. Well, one thing that I can say about this year, 2020, it has brought to the forefront a whole lot of uh, dis uh, enfranchisement against different groups. And I want to say this last thing that that happened uh, where he where Trump put out these uh, um, had the, these people put their their names on this lawsuit helped to bring out in the public sphere those who are not right uh, who are not of uh, do not push for democracy. That's what I want to say. Mm -hmm. Because we have a democratic form of government. And one of the things that, that has happened, all of those people that you see that signed on to that lawsuit, their names, their pictures, and all have been put out into the uh, in, into the media so that and we know that they are not for this form of government. And so the picture has become clearer mm -hmm. on on the, the the legislative body that's not in with um what we uh with our democratic society. So that's a whole lot of things have become clearer. And and then um, another thing that they were saying too that like our democratic um, norms were based on like people doing the right thing, people doing uh, having that. Um, so a lot of the laws, uh, the Constitution, I should say, maybe it's not the laws, were based on people willing to do the right thing but now that has come to the forefront that hey we gotta we gotta put some some something in place now so that if we have somebody that oversteps their bounds there's something to be in place to stop that mm -hmm. so a, a lot of things has come to the forefront uh, so that we are that so that the the collective consciousness will know some of the things that need to be changed. That's what I want to say. Yeah. And I think a lot of times we talk about democracy as if it was an infallible form of government. And one of the biggest problems of democracy is 
a majority that does not consider the minority. And for a long time, this uh, the majority in America uh, has accepted uh, whiteness as the rule. And what we are saying now is that they have uh, kind of twisted that concept so that even though whites are becoming a part of minority, they still want to rule. And that is, in a democracy, the, minor, the minority does not rule. So they're trying to switch over to a system where they can use the, the resources they've gathered over the years as a way to have a minority ruling a majority. And we have to say, and that's why they're saying, oh, you're trying to go against democracy. They're trying to, that's what I'm saying, they're trying to keep that old woven, woven fabric. And that fabric was bad because it took some things that should have been more fair to others and say, no, we're going to make it where it works best for the majority and not for others. I think that we don't want to get another system where that type of minority um, blockage of the, of the, of the minority uh, is a part of human consciousness. We should not think that just because a group is the so-called majority, that then the others don't have, uh, their rights should be lessened. And so we have to make sure as we're going into this new consciousness that we just don't say, we just, uh, we call uh, flipping the, uh, the script, that we're just not saying, oh, we just want the next majority to be able to oppress the coming minority. No, we need to say, how can we make a, a, a righteousness, a justice, a love, so that the next uh, ruling system of this nation actually looks at the rights of the whole family, that we actually want to have it where we put systems in place that oppression is not the main thought of the system. Because when, when you look at all these stories about American greed, how we set up this system where greed was a major factor on how you became rich in here. And it was called like this underlying concept of, well, you don't, you know, it's a, just a part of the American system, that greed is a part of it. Uh, and what we need to say is that why does this greed, why this oppression has to be a part of the great developments we're seeing in America. Because to me, greed did not make some of the best things about America. Greed did not make the best uh, scientific institutions that we have in America. It did not make the best schools that we had in America. Greed is something that they kept adding on to the system uh, so that a few of them could have and they would have the have nots. Because we kind of like accept this idea, oh, you're always gonna have have and have nots. That's a, a, a fallacy, uh, and that's the kind of thinking that we have to get rid of if we want to take the whole human family to another level of consciousness, that we don't believe in those that old fabric of you have to have a democracy where the majority uh, takes over and uses guns and, and, and military to always suppress the others. The guns and military are there supposed to be to protect us all, not to suppress those who are not in those positions of, uh, of dominance. So I think that's why I'm saying it's a new type of thinking that we have, a new type of garment that we need to, to, to be a part of making so that we're just not saying we're going to flip it from one uh, majority to another majority, that we're saying, no, we're going to make a new system that is going to have it where it'll be a more stable. Because to me, the bad part of the other system is it always creates unstable governments. It always creates these uh, things where you always have these crises and these wars to rule them. And we're now, and we're, I think we're in a period where we can say, can't we get out of this idea, not saying that we won't have wars and won't have fights, but we come to the consciousness that wars actually don't settle the, the, the conflicts, that people at some point have to get down, get sit down and actually settle the conflict, that the war itself doesn't do that. 
And so it's just, so we we get to that conscience is that, well, let's start saying it, how we actually get to real solutions to problems in human life. But I'm, I'm probably talking about, I should let some of the others speak. So we have any other comments? But, but from this lesson, I just want to think that we start thinking of family. How do we get people to start coming together and thinking of themselves as being a part of a family? How should that family work to make it so that all members of that family uh, get the things that they deserve uh, to be able to make it? How we get some new concepts of who is the worker and who is the, the boss? Because I say in any system you get, there are going to be different levels of people. But why do we have this thought that if you're on the higher levels, that's where all the blessings are. When you're on the lower levels, there are no blessings there for you. Because like I said, when we were talking about those Christmas Christmases, where we know that our people were not always at the highest levels of society, and yet they still found ways to find joy, how to find happiness, how to find peace, and how to inspire others. How can we make sure that that stays there and continues? So any other thoughts before we go on to, to end? Because we are, I'm not sure what time it is, but I think we're getting close to the end of time. And I see some people, I mean, I'm not sure whether they're falling out because of the system or that they uh, have other things that they need to get to. And it is about 12, 15, so we're kind of over our time. But are any uh, thoughts before we close out? But I hope we all see that we need to think about what are the fabrics that we're using to create this new society for ourselves and how can we make it better. So I'm, I will keep it open a little bit afterwards, but I am going to go to closing out our session for now. Uh, I have here a reminder of myself that we need to think of those words that we got uh, back in November from uh, Supreme Mother's message that I shall thank and praise God for his understanding. I shall thank and praise God for his understanding. Uh, thank you for being with us. We will have the recording up. Uh, thank you those who donate for me. Uh, baths will be this week, probably around Tuesday. I should have the baths ready for any, all those who uh, have the want baths. Um, and now for our dismissal, let me say, may the love of God illuminate your way. May the will of God direct you each day. May the truth of God all errors depart and may the peace of God forever dwell in your heart. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs>